again, uh, welcome to this conversation on justice featuring a uh, dialogue dealing with law enforcement and based a comparison between two countries. And I'm really very honored to uh, bring forward right now um, our, our featured speaker from our neighbor uh, to the north, Sergeant Craig Marshall uh, Smith. Uh, he was born and raised in a family with four other siblings within the black community of Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's a father, writer, author, historian, and an 18-year veteran of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Sergeant Smith has spent much of his career working in the area of race relations and cross-cultural understanding. He has written four books, including his most recent, You Had Better Be White, by 6 a.m., the African-Canadian experience in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Sergeant Smith continues to contribute to the area of education as all of his books are approved and used in classrooms across the province. Sergeant Smith has been the recipient of several awards, including the 2003 Canadian National Rio Award, 2012 Harry Jerome Award, the 2013 Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the 2014 Nova Scotia Human Rights Award, and uh, last month, Sergeant Smith was appointed as a member of the Order of Merit of Police Forces in Canada. This is the highest recognition that a police officer uh, can achieve in, in Canada. And I must say, when um, uh, Chief Clarence Edwards sent an email around, maybe about a, a several weeks ago, uh, saying that uh, Sergeant Smith was going to be in the area of Washington, D.C. I don't know if you're here for a police week. I don't even really know what police week is. But um, I really immediately jumped on the, um, I, I jumped on the, the, the force to be able to bring him here because, you know, this country from Ferguson to Baltimore, we are experiencing an upsurge in incidents of police use of excessive and sometimes deadly force against unarmed Blacks. And my understanding is, I'm correct if I'm mistaken, but my understanding is that some of Canada's major population centers have also experienced frictions between its national police force and uh, people of color. So, you know, that call to my colleagues, um, Chief Clarence Edwards and um, Officer Brian Hampton, said, let's get a little dialogue going on here to see just what's happening here, what's happening there, what are some of the uh, comparisons, what are some of the contrasts, and what are some of the solutions that we can kind of jointly bring together to um, deal with the situation. So let's give it up for uh, Sergeant Craig Marshall Smith. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'll apologize, first of all, for my tardiness in getting here, but um, getting around DC was a little harder than I anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> Just say. Um, uh, before I start, uh, you know, in my talk, I want to thank two people. Uh, number one, Mr. Peter Haynes, who's sitting over there in the back, who uh, was the person who helped to coordinate uh, me coming down to DC uh, during National Police Week. And then, of course, to my uh, good friend, although this is the first time we've actually met in person, uh, Clarence, who uh, we've known each other for the last 10 years. As a matter of fact, when I did the first edition of You Better Be White by, first, first, uh, by uh, 6 a.m., um, I called Clarence and he provided the quote that was used in that book as well. And so uh, when it came around to the second edition, uh, I uh, put the phone call through again. We've been in touch with each other over the years and he very quickly, without hesitation, said yes to write the forward to me in the second edition. So I have the opportunity to thank him for this time. Mm -hmm. um, interesting when you were speaking there, Brother Ron, because uh, I joined the RSVP at 35. And, um, you know, some of the things that you just said, and I'll touch upon them as we go through, some of the things you just said uh, hold true to the, uh, our, our National Police Force of Canada as well. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we've gotten to where we are right now, the road that has gotten us there. But one of the things that you said, which, which uh, I'll follow up you know, later on, is when you talk about selecting chiefs of police uh, within communities. It's something that we've been doing for a number of years with the Aboriginal communities in Canada, in Nova Scotia in particular. Uh, because of the fact that we have 13 reserves and their federal dollars tied to those reserves. So therefore, when we're working out agreements, one of the things is that they get the, uh, they get some say in who is their national commander or the person in charge of the reserve and or the makeup or composition of those members that are on the reserve as well. So you know, the right to get some people as well. Uh, 
Who, who is Craig Smith? Craig Smith was born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia. My parents, my lineage, on my, uh, my father's side paternally, uh, dates back to the Black Refugees in the War of 1812. We started coming to Nova Scotia in 1813, September of 1813. And on my mother's side, the Black Royalists, who first came to Nova Scotia in uh, 1784. Um, and so that, that's the, my connection to, to my American cousins, I'll say. Um, and in Nova Scotia, the vast majority of us that are indigenous black people from Nova Scotia uh, trace our, our roots back here to, uh, to the U.S. Um, you know, having joined the RCMP at 35, I've worn many hats before I got there. I drove a, a city bus in Halifax for five years. I uh, worked at an inner city community YMCA for, uh, sorry, inner city uh, library for, for 12 years. Um, my last role with there, I was the uh, community outreach person and youth worker. I ran the community YMCA as well. Um, and my connection, connecting with the, the policing world actually started while I worked for the libraries. In 1991, we had an incident in Halifax that they called a race riot. I called with some brothers that were acting out in frustration and busted out a bunch of windows in, unfortunately, their own community. But in no way was there any interaction between themselves and any other ethnic group. So to call it a race riot, um, you know, really uh, put things out of proportion, but it was enough to get national attention in Nova Scotia. And that's my first connection with, uh, with the policing world. Because out of that, uh, I became a member of uh, a task force that the Halifax Regional Police were putting together. And uh, from its inception in 92 up until the time it disbanded in 96, just two weeks prior to being in for the RCMP's training academy, uh, I had become the chair of that committee. And I, as well, I was also active on a multicultural liaison committee with the Canadian Chiefs of Police Association, which is provided to Chiefs of Police from across the country. And so therefore, I got an opportunity to see some of the positive things that were going on, and were also to contribute to some of the stuff that was going on across the country at that time as well. I've served on a variety of different boards, committees, organizations. Uh, and the snapshot uh, at the top there with the, the 90s here, dude, is uh, me as the youth library youth worker at the North Branch Library. Uh, uh, Reverend Jackson was in uh, Nova Scotia back in 2009, and I uh, ended up being uh, his uh, traveling counterpart while he was there. Um, and so that's from that photo there. And uh, two of my books, the Ultimate African Heritage Quiz book, which had just come out in source, that's 2008, not 2009. Uh, and the first edition of You Better Be White by 6 a.m. Uh, I'm also an aide to camp. So in Nova Scotia, because of course the fact that we still have uh, Queen Elizabeth as the head of our Commonwealth, uh, it, we have a, an appointment by the Queen, who is our Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. And as the, the uh, Premier General J.J. Grant, and uh, each one of the lieutenant governors has a number of different individuals who act as aide de camps for them. So that's the ADC that was on my name there when you saw the, uh, you had my name at the bottom of the page. And so you basically travel around with the lieutenant governor. Once a month you sit down and see what uh, job possibilities or, or events that he has to go to, and then you uh, help to liaise with those uh, hosting organizations to make sure that they are handling the protocol and everything. Time. So that photo there of me would have been in um, at the lower left-hand corner was in 2010 when Queen Elizabeth II uh, was visiting Nova Scotia. And at that time, uh, the Lieutenant Governor for Nova Scotia was a lady by the name of May Ann Francis, who was the very first black Lieutenant Governor in the history of the province. And then that's, uh, I, I do a lot of presentations and, and travel around the province. I uh, did 25 actually uh, last month, uh, or two months ago in February, Black History Month. But that's a photo there of uh, me in uh, one of our community colleges in uh, Cape Breton. Policing in Canada. Royal Canadian Mounted Police were established in 1783. And um, obviously in 1783 we were looking at a very white organization. Uh, it uh, went from being the Northwest Mounted Police to the Royal Northwest Mounted Police in, in uh, 1904 when uh, King George VII bestowed the Prefects Royal upon the, uh, the organization. And then in 1920, it um, amalgamated with the Dominion Police Service, which were more so in the eastern part of the country, to create the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. For, us as a, for me, as a black person in the organization, and for many of us that are in the organization, uh, 1941 is when we see our first connecting with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Why? Because that's the very first documentation that we can find of somebody black applying to the organization. And um, I'll just quickly go to the book and just give you, uh, show you how that was met. On October the 20th, 1941, there were um, two colored individuals, Les Bryan and Alf Coward. 
Al Qaeda was a gentleman on the upper left side. Here's the, here's the memo that, that was circulated. On this date, two colored men, namely Les Bryant and Alf Coward, aged 20 and 22 years respectively, and both residents of Sydney, Nova Scotia, have made application for engagement in the force. While it is felt that these uh, two men are, in, are uh, eligible, we'd be pleased to have your comments before for proceeding any further with their application. So they went into their hometown in, in Sydney, Cape Breton, and said, we'd like to become members of the RCMP. The inspector, Inspector Evans, I like using names too. <laughs> inspector Evans wrote a memo and sent it to our headquarters in Halifax. Halifax being the capital city of the province of Nova Scotia. And Halifax writes back, this problem has arisen before and been dealt with in other divisions. This problem. <laughs> he then takes the memo and sends it to Ottawa, to our nation's capital, to the commissioner himself of the day, for the commissioner to respond to. And the commissioner's response is, Referring to Inspector Evans' report of October the 20th in connection to the two colored men, Les Bryant and Alf Howard, who have applied for engagement, the Commissioner advises that these men should be directed and afforded the opportunity of writing the educational tests with the hope that we shall find that they have not successfully passed. <laughs> As to definitely refuse them that opportunity of applying on account of the color of their skin would raise questions about our policy, which the Commissioner does not wish to do. <laughs> Their educational test should be forwarded here for the commissioner's examination before any definite reply is made to them, unless that we, have, we have found that they could not naturally be considered because of the score. So that's our first connecting um, with, with black individuals or black individuals trying to get to the organization. And it's funny because my first poster, which was in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, one day I get a brown envelope in the mail, open up the envelope, and those two memos that I just uh, read to you are in the envelope for you to hang on. And so, um, when I was writing the book, and even doing the first edition of the book, uh, I couldn't tell the, 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 the story and the history and the struggle of us to become members of the organization unless I went back as far as I could to, to look at when we were first trying to get in, what the response was by the organization itself. Um, interestingly enough, my daughters thought I was going to get fired because I put that in there. Um, but, uh, um, lo and behold, here I still am 18 years later. The second individual to apply that I know of is the gentleman that's down in the lower right-hand corner, and that's Dr. Lauren White. Um, his, his lineage goes back to Virginia. His father, Captain Reverend Dr. Uh, William A. White, was the only black captain or officer, commissioned officer, in uh, the British Empire during World War I. A very well-known minister in Nova Scotia as well, and uh, uh, Lauren's sister, Portia White. We kind of look at her as the Marian Anderson of Canada, a very well-known and respected uh, contralto who actually made her first international debut in New York City in 1944. But Lauren applied to the force in 47. What happened prior to Lauren applying, is what, and in between these two years, is what really um, made him think that after having had completed his first year of university, he was going to get to the RCMP. On November the 8th, 1946, a lady by the name of Viola Desmond was arrested for sitting in the whites only section of the Roseland Theater in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Yes, we had Jim Crow laws in Nova Scotia. We don't talk about them a whole lot, because the Canadian way is if we kind of sweep it under the rug or hide it, we don't talk about it, then people don't have to think that it ever happened. Um, but my old Desmond was arrested for sitting. She was, I, I'll, I'll back up a little bit, she was a very uh, well-known and respected beautician in Nova Scotia. She had gone to, uh, uh, to New Jersey and New York and, and studied under Madam C.J. Walker at, her, at, at Madam C.J. Walker's school came back and set up her own uh, school in Halifax. And, um, you know, with not having, without having UPS or FedEx at her fingertips, um, and being the progressive woman that she was, she got to pack up her car and drive across the province to, to uh, sell her beauty care. Uh, and, and on November 8th, when she got to New Glasgow, her car broke down, had to spend the night um, in, in uh, not being able to, to go any further until the car was going to be fixed in the morning. So she went to the theater, sat in the went in, bought a ticket, sat downstairs in the theater. Bellboy comes in, tells her she can't sit there, she has to go upstairs. She said, well, I'll, go, I'll buy a ticket for, for downstairs because I can afford to. I want to sit down here. My feet are tied, I don't want to go up in the balcony. He said, you people can't buy a ticket for downstairs. She said, well, I'm not moving. He called the manager. The manager came in, told her, how do you move? He called the police. He called the police. Uh, now, Viola Desmond was about <laughs> five foot four and about 110 pounds. Uh, the Glasgow police came in, picked her up, dropped her up, took her off to jail. Uh, she stayed in jail overnight, wasn't told any of the, uh, the uh, legal procedures that she needed to know of adjournments or anything, she had enough time to confer with a lawyer. Uh, she went in, she was <coughs> uh, $20 and 
the six dollars court court charges for defrauding the provincial government of one penny amusement tax. Nowhere in the case did the question of race ever came up. What they said was because she went in and bought a ticket for upstairs and had and bought a ticket for downstairs and then went and sat downstairs, she had defrauded the provincial government of one cent amusement tax. That's what went on the books. And so what that did though, because of a lady by the name of Dr. Carrie Bess, who was a very well known journalist uh, and, and, and advocate for civil rights, she had started a newspaper called The Clarion. And because of the fact of all the notoriety that the Viola Desmond case got, Lauren really thought in 1947 he had a shot at becoming part of our National Police Force. So he's sitting at home after going through all the application and having gone through the physical fitness and all that, uh, only to get a call one day from a superintendent who said, Lauren, can you come in? I'd like to talk to you. So Lauren comes into headquarters and he sits down and he said, Lauren, you know, you meet all the requirements to become an RCMP officer. You've passed every test, you've passed all the requirements that are needed. But unfortunately, we don't believe that Canadian society is ready to question the color of the mounting that comes through the door when they call for help. And so we won't be uh, going any further with your application. He went on to be a teacher, actually, in Halifax and died in 2012, but taught for 32 years uh, in the city. So those are the, the, you know, the first accounts that, that we have of black individuals trying to get into uh, to the force. I have an uncle now, a late uncle, my mom's oldest brother, who since passed to apply in the 50s as well, and again was met with. Um, he had met all the qualifications, but they came back and told him he had too much protein in his urine. And so, therefore, he couldn't be considered to be an RCMP officer until that was taken care of and cleared up. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's always, especially when it comes to institutionalized systemic racism, if you can't get him with Plan A, then you get him with Plan B. And so, Al Cowher at the top actually passed the exam in 41, but then they played the waiting game on him. You know, they told him, look, there's a whole lot of, you know, basically a whole lot of hurdles you have to jump through and get over it become a member of the organization. We have to do background checks. We have to look at your past. And it's going to take a while for us to do that whole processing. So don't call us. We'll call you. So, you know, Al went away. Gave it a month call, no tour, we're still in the process of going through things, it's going to take a little while. Called him another month after that. You know, he called for about four or five months before he realized it didn't matter how long he waited. He was never going to become a member. He went on as well to uh, uh, to university and then went on to Ontario, uh, settling in Mississauga, Ontario. And in 1954, when Atlantic Canada were coming out with their very first variety show on TV because we were going to uh, basically steal a page from are akin to the South and do something that looked like the Nat King Cole show. He had the very first variety show in <coughs> Canada, the Al Power show. Uh, why I wrote the book? I wrote the book because I really wanted it to be something that had the organization to start to talk about things. Um, as I said before, you know, in, in Canada we're real good at not talking about the rough things, not talking about the, the white elephant that's in the room, and not wanting to talk about um, some of the more unsavory parts of our history. And that's no different when it comes to our national police force. And so for me, it became, how do I you know, put things down so that we have a dialogue as to where we are as an organization? Now, there are 19,000 members of the RCMP across the country. Out of that 19,000, only between 650 and 700 are black. So we still have a long ways to go when it comes to uh, uh, you know, upping our numbers. But I'll also say, uh, within the country, we have, we have a, a population of approximately 36 million. Uh, but we only have a little, a little under 800,000 that are black from coast to coast as well. So our numbers, uh, when it comes to looking at uh, you know, how we feed up and how we look at the national organization of things as well, is, uh, is part of the reason. And, and you know, there's no question the turbulent history that we've had with the organization, with policing in general, is why it's still not one of those top five when it comes to young black people looking for a job. Um, it's interesting when, when Ron was talking with the word, or, or, or was Clarence talking with the word service versus force. Uh, when I joined in 96, we were, the, we, were, we were a police force. And it just slowly became that it wasn't as political palatable to say police force because of the use of the word force. And so then it became, you know, let's make ourselves marketable, let's make ourselves like a business. And it may have been because of the fact that we had Walt Disney taking care of our promotion of the organization for, for a number of years as well. Um, but it became a police service. And so very, very rarely will you see anybody use the word police force when they talk about the RCMP. But as I said, when I got into 96, we were a force. And whenever it, you, you talk to it, you talk to a police force. Now you never see any writing when it's coming out of a national headquarters. It's a police service. When I talk about some of those social justice issues, these are just a few um, that, I, I, that I talked about. That's Viola Desmond right here. That's the stamp. Uh, in 2010, April the 15th, 
the uh, Lieutenant Governor, Nan Francis, the lady I spoke about a few moments ago, uh, signed a royal proclamation by Queen Elizabeth II, which is called a free pardon. Now, unlike a pardon that anybody can apply for because they've committed a crime, but then they've gone a number of years with keeping their nose clean and so they can get a pardon. A free pardon is something that is only issued by royal prerogative by the Crown. And a free pardon asserts the fact that a crime was never committed in the first place. And so a free pardon is granted to Viola Desmond posthumously on April the 15th, April 15th uh, 2010. And I had the, uh, the fortune of being uh, the aide de camp that day with, uh, with uh, Nan when she was the lieutenant governor and actually signed the free pardon into, uh, into law. Um, we spoke with Viola Desmond case. Dr. Bernie Rocky Jones is a gentleman who is at the top of the, the photo there. He's actually the person who now the Nova Scotia Human Rights Award was named after that uh, I received uh, last year. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, he would have been the most feared black man in Canada. Why? Because of his affiliation to the American Black Panther. <laughs> he brought the Panthers to Halifax in 68. And for the lack of a better term, he scared the shit out of the Panthers. <laughs> 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 that led that led to the formation of the Black United Front in 1969, which became the unifying voice for black people in the province. And it was, you know, it was Dr. W.P. Oliver, who was the moderate, who was the minister, who was my great uncle and my godfather, uh, and then it was Rocky. So it was either deal with Rocky or deal with Dr. Oliver, and so they chose to deal with Dr. Oliver. Uh, but uh, Rocky laid the groundwork for the formation of the uh, Black United Front and a number of other different things uh, that have happened in the province. He passed away about a year and a half ago now of a heart attack. Um, but um, again, one of the few black people even up to the point where he passed that could automatically um, elicit respect from an audience the moment he walked into a room, especially the older white establishment in the province. So a very big uh, a loss to us when it came to somebody who, who was that instrument for change for us. 1969, the Ronald Drummond case was the very first time that a white police officer in Nova Scotia was actually uh, um, fired from a job because of his treatment of a black youth. Uh, Ronnie Drummond grew up in the same community I did in, ha in Halifax in the inner city and um, was standing on the street corner one day when he was told to get along by the police. He said a few words back and they popped him in the car and took him for a long drive to the, to the station. And a uh, police officer, one of them sat in the back of the police car while Ronnie was in handcuffs sat on top of him and, and punched him in the head over and over again. Um, the one thing that did happen was when Ronnie was in cells, we were lucky enough in 69, we had two black police officers on the force, the very first, two of the first three on the force. They made a phone call to Ronald, his, uh, his uh, uncle, Delmore Buddy Day, and uh, who was also one of the founding members of the Black uh, United Front, and uh, said, look, Ronnie's in lockup, he's all bruised up, his face is all banged up, you better come down here. So he went down, made some demands to see him, he did. There was a newspaper article in the paper the next day, and then uh, there was an inquest into uh, what happened to Ronnie. And as a result of that, uh, Halifax Police Department uh, Constable uh, Bob Smith lost his job as a result of, uh, of that beating that he gave to Ronald Drummond. Um, and again, I won't go through all of them that are there, only to say that, uh, as you can see as we move further down, there are still things um, that are happening today. We had the incident in 2008 in Digby, Nova Scotia, where there were a group of off-duty police officers in a van, and two young black men were walking past the van when out of the, uh, the van somebody yelled the N-word. Uh, the two individuals turned around, confronted them. Uh, the person who actually said it didn't jump out of the van, but one of his buddies did, and he was knocked out with one punch by one of the young black men who were there. Uh, luckily enough, that was caught on tape as well because of the fact that there were cameras in Digby happened. Uh, and out of that came uh, a, a protest and came uh, um, a whole lot of attention, a national attention on Digby itself. And uh, there had to be obviously some repair that was done. Uh, part of my, my function within the RCMP uh, over the years, I started up in the Army where I was just a general duty police officer in uniform patrolling the streets uh, for uh, six and a half years. Then I went to a general investigative unit where I did GIS for two years. Then in 2005, I got promoted, and I came to Halifax as a diversity policing analyst for the province. So it was my job to connect with the black communities across the province, to look at uh, recruitment, to look at just trying to better the relationship on the ground, and then internally to also look at the black membership in the organization that's in Nova Scotia, which right now numbers about 43 out of 1,100 members. Uh, and what can we do to ensure that they're getting the training and they're getting the opportunities for promotion, and that they're getting the opportunity to get to, to, to experience and develop 
in different areas within the organization. So I did that from 2005 to 2011. So when that happened in 2008, I got a phone call from our commanding officer from the province who said, I'd like you to go to Digby for four months and help work on bettering the relationship between the organization and, uh, and the community of Digby. And it was a, a hard, hard fought of battle. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why, uh, and I talk about it in the second book, it doesn't appear in the first one. In 2006, two years prior in Digby, their commanding officer was under investigation for racial uh, racial comments he had made in the detachment, as well as for uh, sexual advances he made against one of the uh, uh, detachment assistants. And during that time, some of the uh, individuals in Digby were concerned that the RCMP were just going to, to wipe or sweep uh, that whole investigation under the rug because it was a black detachment commander, a white sorry, detachment commander. And so uh, I got a phone call one afternoon from somebody in the community who said, I have some documents, I need to give them to somebody who I can trust with. So I get in my car because I'm in Halifax, drive two and a half hours to Digby. She hands me an envelope. And I know it's got to be important or she wouldn't have called me. So funny as it is, I didn't know what was in the envelope until I started to drive back up the highway to Halifax. And then I said, shit, you all the way down here, you don't even know what's in this. <laughs> so I pull over on the highway on, on, the, curb, on, on the, uh, the curb, and I open it up, and I look and say, oh, it's the actual, each, what happens is, during the course of an internal investigation, the complainant in that, or the victim in that, is updated every month. This was the update that had been given to the complainant. The complainant was friends with somebody who was black in the community and had given her a copy of it as well. That's what she gave to me. So I get back to Halifax. It's about 5.30 in the evening. I'm not sure what to do with it. In the corner it says Protected B Document. Protected B Document is something that I know technically uh, I'm not supposed to have uh, as a member of the organization without it being passed on to somebody else. So I call my boss. He says, lock it up overnight. You'll have to pass it into internal affairs. And Somebody talked about internal affairs there earlier, how, how well they're loved. Uh, but you'll have to pass it into internal affairs in the morning. You're right. The last thing I wanted to do was walk into internal affairs. But I walk in the next morning and I give them the envelope. And the first question that's out of their mouth was, somebody will be talking to you a little later because we need to know when you got that right. <laughs> so I go, I go back to my office, sit down, you know, the lumps in my throat. And, my, and uh, so I get asked the next, uh, later on that afternoon, come over to one of the investigators. And uh, he said, I know. at that time, he actually lied to me because he goes, we're going to be starting a, a, a criminal breach of trust uh, investigation, and we're going to have to know who gave you those documents. And I didn't really, you know, even in GIS, internal breach of trust is one I hadn't had never dealt with, so I wasn't even, I didn't even know what the facts of the elements were. Um, but I very quickly said, you know, no, uh, that's a, I'm considering who gave me this a source. You never give up when your sources are. So I very quickly said, yeah, that's fine, but I'm not prepared to say it was. And then I was asked the question that really just put it on the table. All we want to know is whose side are you on? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I just said, well, I'm not prepared. Unbeknownst to me, what would happen a few days later is that they would go to Digby, pick up the person that they believed, had given me the documents, put her in a room and threw them on the table for her and said, do you know Craig Smith? And where do you think we got those from? Uh, I was persona non grata at Digby for about a year before they realized the fact that they had no signed documentation or no audio or videotape that said Craig Smith handed in anything. And they realized that it was some smoke and mirrors at the start, but the fact that I hadn't given anybody up, and that's really what, that, that repaired my reputation so that by the time I got down there in 2008, everything was good between me and the community. Um, but that, just, just an interesting piece. And it's something I've tried to pass on. Uh, to younger members as well. Don't be afraid to be involved in your community, whether it be Aboriginal or Black, but just recognize the fact that at some point, if they feel you're too connected, that question about loyalty is going to come up. Uh, then we've had, you know, we, we had a cross burning in 2010 on uh, the, the front lawn of an interracial couple in, in Nova Scotia, and the first prosecution of a hate crime in, the, in, in Canada as well happened in 2010 because of that cross burning. And then, of course, the, free, the signing of the free pardon uh, for Viola Desmond. Our voice for social justice issues in the province has come out of two things. The African Baptist Association, which is now called the African United Baptist Association, which was founded by Reverend Richard Preston, and that's a, a, a portrait of him over on the, uh, the left-hand side, who was from Richmond, Virginia, who came to Nova Scotia in uh, 1816 in search of his mother. He was a runaway slave. He was taken in by a minister, Reverend John Burton, who sent him to England, where he became an ordained minister in 1831, and then came back to Nova Scotia and founded the uh, Cornwall Street Baptist Church, uh, which was the first black-owned black -owned and run church in the province. 
and then in uh, 1854 he founded the uh, African United Baptist Association as a way of bringing all the black churches together in the province, all 11 of them together, and giving them one unified voice in speaking against social justice issues that were in the province. And 162 years later, it's still uh, uh, thriving and the oldest black organization in Atlantic Canada. And then, of course, the formation, as I said there, of the Black United Front. Uh, the photo that you see here, of course, has uh, Stolen Carmichael sitting there at the table. That's the Panthers in Halifax in 68. And then the gentleman here uh, closest to me is uh, Jules Oliver, who was the first director of the Black United Front. Black United Front was defunct in, I want to say, 1994. 1994. Um, again, organization which was funded by the provincial government, um, and over time funding got cut back, and got cut back, and got cut back, and then of course there were some uh, jewels that left, and there have been three or four other directors, and then it became, you know, there appears to be some mismanagement, and we're going to take back that money, and we'll come up with another, an um, another umbrella to, um, to look at the concerns of black people in, in Nova Scotia, and the money, the Black United Front was uh, dissolved. Uh, since then, we've never had a, a voice um, to look at the social issues that pertain to one unified voice in the province since then. Uh, there have been a number of different things. Actually, one of the government, the provincial government agencies even came up and created the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs in the province. But the African, again, smoke and mirrors, because the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs job is to look at how government deals with the black community and how government uh, uh, provides services to the black community. But it's not there to look at the concerns of the black community, only government's interaction with the black community. And so therefore, we still don't have that unified voice. Our reality, I gave you the, the numbers earlier uh, with regard to uh, how many people in the province, how many people, black people in the country. Uh, I mentioned the fact that, uh, again, uh, we, uh, we, much like you, especially with, with a, uh, a PC government, uh, Prime Minister Harper took a page from, from uh, President Bush, and he does believe in tougher on crime and more jails. And more jails in, in Canada has meant more jails and more brown people in jails, whether they be black or, or First Nations. Uh, the two major events that have happened in the last number of years. In 2012, the chief of police uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, is a black man. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, 2015, just a few weeks ago, Toronto got its first black chief of police in the history of that city as well. Boom. Good. Mark Saunders. Uh, President RCMP, as I said earlier, 19,000 of us, only about 650 to 700 that are black in the whole province. Two biggest events that have happened in the history of the RCMP would have been the lady down at the bottom, uh, is the first and only black female to ever become a commissioned officer in the RCMP. That's Inspector Lucille <coughs> Irving. And at the top above her, the gentleman in the middle, is Craig Gibson, who is the first and only black commanding officer of the division. Um, our provinces, you have states, we have provinces. Our provinces within the RCMP are called divisions. He was in charge of uh, Prince Edward Island, the smallest division in the country, uh, but he's the first black commanding officer of the division, and the only black commanding officer of the division. And again, when I did this book, I wanted to make sure that I, I go into the classrooms and talk to kids. I wanted to reach out in more than just one way. And so I had my cousin, Milo Gordon, actually do a quilt for me. I wasn't specific enough to say, I just need something small. That's actually eight feet by eight feet. <laughs> uh, haven't been able to take them to many schools because we haven't had anything big enough to put it up on. But uh, she entitled it, if these, if these Walls Could Talk. It's also one of the few pieces of RCMP memorabilia that has a black mountain depicted on it. Because if you go anywhere in our country, you can find pencils, plates, uh, t-shirts, uh, you know, um, cups, cufflinks, coasters, uh, and they're all white Mounties. Matter of fact, you will even find a couple of beaver and bear and moose that are, on, are dressed in a Mountie uniform, but nowhere will you find a black Mountie in any of that memorabilia. And so therefore, I'm hoping to turn that actually into a limited edition print in the next couple of months so that it, it is available to, uh, to, to members. Because I've had a lot ask me about it, and then when I told them it took her a year to make and how big it is, they were like, okay, well, it's got to be another way to do that. Um, I want to stop there, and, and I know there's supposed to be some time for questions, so I, uh, let's do questions. Yeah. Thank you.